Hello there, my name is Florian and I welcome you to IT Tech Tips. When you're watching this video on your PC, on a notebook or any other mobile device, you're using one. I'm talking about operating systems. But also when you're driving a car or press a button on an elevator, you're using one as well. Operating systems are omnipresent. But how does an operating system actually work and what does it do? I will talk about that and more in this episode. Let's have a look. First, let's go back in time for about 40 to 60 years to time before even Unix existed. Let's have a look at how a computer like the one you see on this picture was built back then. Every supplier had its own software for its hardware. So those systems were not only expensive because of the hardware, but also because the software on the system were typically from the same supplier. So the software was locked to the hardware. The software only ran on this specific computer. These systems were also very closed. They were a closed ecosystem because you needed to know assembly language to program the systems and you needed to have the documentation for the systems which typically also was not publicly available. So there was a really limited set of people who were able to program these systems. Also, the systems were limited by architecture. And I don't mean just because your smartwatch nowadays has about 1000 times the power of a big computer from 60 years ago. I'm talking about external hardware like printers and other output and input devices which were only designed for this specific computer. You could not use them on other systems and that made them also very expensive because they had to be certified by the supplier of the system. I think it's important to mention that in modern environments, on modern operating systems, on modern computers, we also see a tendency to those types of closed systems. So you have an ecosystem like the Microsoft Store or iTunes or the Google App Store where you have your applications and there are then also only for a specific device like an iPhone or a Windows 10 computer or games that are only optimized to run if they're connected to Steam. So these are also kind of closed ecosystems, but it's not as bad as like 60 years ago because there is a much bigger variety in these ecosystems. So there's not so much of a monopoly as back in the days. But even today, Linux is still a very open operating system. Many components of it are open source and everybody in the community is theoretically able to contribute to the development of the operating system and you have the capability, if you know how to program, to really know what's going on behind the scenes. So here's a quick diagram of the architecture of the past. On the bottom, there's the hardware like CPU, RAM, the graphics card and output and input devices like printers, keyboards. And on top of that, directly on top of that, there's the software like word processing, spreadsheets, multimedia, games, well, games not so much as today because the graphics output was really limited back in the days, but you get the picture. And typically on the smaller systems, only one user could work at the same time. A little later when the Unix systems became present, they became multi-user systems. So how does this look today? In time, people came to the conclusion that we need to have an abstraction layer on top of the hardware. So it was needed to develop a software which provided this abstraction layer to the hardware and provided an interface for software developers to program against this abstraction layer and not anymore against directly the hardware. This software, which ran on a system, 
was called system software, but it's the same as the more modern expression operating system. So the operating system is a very large piece of software typically, which runs directly on the hardware and enables other software to run on top of the operating system. With this kind of abstraction, there comes a big advantage. The software developers now don't have to deal anymore or not as much anymore with the hardware directly because of this intermediate layer. There are now printer drivers, graphic drivers, storage access is much easier and usually there's also some networking software to enable the software developer to much more easily develop software which runs over the network, like the internet. Most operating systems nowadays allow to run multiple users simultaneously. Just as a quick example, if you're working on your Windows 10 computer and your partner needs to access the computer for a little while, you can just go to switch user and your partner can continue to work and your work will still be available in the background and when your partner is done, you can switch back to your user and continue working on what you were working before. Here's a diagram of how a modern architecture looks. On the bottom, we have, like with the older architecture, the hardware layer. On top, we have the software, so your word processing, your spreadsheets, multimedia, games, which are nowadays a really popular category of software. And in the middle, you have the operating system, which handles the hardware access, memory management, multitasking. I will get to that in a few moments. So what's the popularity of operating systems as of the year 2020 on PCs? Of course, the statistics differ a little bit, so it's only a rough estimate than a really exact number. The most popular operating system on PCs is Microsoft Windows 10, which runs on about 77% of all client PCs. These are at home, in corporations, globally. Apple Mac OS X runs on about 18% of the client PCs. Linux on 2%. I'm only talking about client PCs, not about servers. And there are some other operating systems which account for the rest, 3%. On mobile devices, we have a different picture. Google Android runs on about 74% of all mobile devices, like your mobile phone or smaller tablets. Apple iOS, is at 25% and the others are negligible. It's about 1%. Some of them are probably still Windows phones. When we have a look at tablet operating systems, there we have another leader, which is Apple with their iOS with uh, 59% and then followed by Google Android, which makes up for 41%. And here as well, the other operating systems are negligible with less than 1%. So you can say on tablets, there runs either Apple iOS or Google Android. Let's have a look at what an operating system actually does. The operating system runs other software as we saw in one of the last diagrams. The operating system assigns resources to each software, so RAM or CPU or network access or access to your sound card, and it isolates programs from each other. This is really important for security reasons. So if you're running on your web browser an e-banking software and you have a malware on your PC, the operating system must make sure that this malware software is unable to access the memory resources of your e-banking because otherwise the malware would be able to manipulate data on your software and it could, for example, transfer money in your name 
to the account of the malware developer. So the operating system must make sure that the e-banking application is separated from the malware application and all other applications on the PC as well. The operating system also enables multiple applications to run simultaneously. It's not actually simultaneously, but the programs switch so quickly that you as a human cannot recognize that the program switch so quickly. So you have application A, then you have application B, then you have application C. And this changes so fast that you think they run really simultaneously. When this multitasking really started on the client PCs in the late 1980s, early 1990s, back then PCs were much slower and then you were able to tell how the multitasking worked. Because if you worked in one application, the other applications became really slow. But nowadays you can hardly recognize that. So let's have a quick look at how the multitasking used to work on a bit older operating systems. Multitasking back then used a method called cooperative multitasking. In cooperative multitasking, you have several applications running and each application gets some CPU time and memory access from the operating system and the application itself decides when to give back these resources to the operating system. So for example, the operating system goes to application A and tells the application, you got 10 milliseconds to run and after that, you have to give me back the resources. So I can assign another 10 milliseconds to another application and so on and so on. But if an application crashed or was badly programmed and it gave not back the time to the operating system, all other applications would also stop working because they never got any resources back from the operating system and we would have a really sad user. So when this problem was recognized, we needed to develop a better form of multitasking. And this multitasking is called preemptive multitasking. With preemptive multitasking, the operating system is boss. As before, you have several applications running and the operating system switches really fast between these applications. But when an application crashes now, the operating system is able to just take away the resources from this application. So the application itself would not be running anymore, but all other applications would continue running. And this improves the user experience and the stability of a system a lot. As stated in the earlier slides, an operating system also provides an abstraction between the hardware for the users and software developers. So for example, if a software developer wants to access a file on the hard drive, the developer can access a routine from the operating system and tell this routine, give me file A. Back in the days, a software developer would have needed access directly to the hardware. He needed to develop a file system and he needed to develop an interface to access the file and then access the file for reading and for writing and writing back to the hard drive. And nowadays he can just call an interface of the operating system. API stands for Application Programming Interface. So it's a defined and usually well-documented interface for software developers. And of course, most modern operating systems are really convenient for the users and they provide tools out of the box. For example, a file explorer for accessing files or a simple text editor or a calculator, a web browser for accessing the internet. In a modern operating system, usually right out of the box, the user gets a pretty decent desktop experience. Now let's conclude this episode with three security tips to improve the security of your daily work with your operating system. Number one, updates. You should install updates to your operating system regularly, especially on the most popular operating system, Windows 10. This is really important because, because of the popularity of Windows 10, 
it's the platform which gets attacked most by evil hackers. Just make sure you don't install any fake updates. You should use the Microsoft update routines and never ever use any updates which come from a website. Number two, do not work as an administrator. When you install your operating system yourself, you should have one administrator, which you only use for installing software and configuring the system, and all other users on the system should be normal users without administrative permissions. Many malware only runs because they have administrative permissions on the system. If you work as a normal user, you are much more secure than if you work with administrative permissions because for example if a malware tries to change your system configuration and you are logged in as a normal user the malware just does not have the access rights to do that for specific tasks like installing a new software or when you actually need to configure the operating system you just log out log in as an administrator and then log back in as user number three use multiple passwords. Even more importantly than using long and secure passwords, it is to use multiple passwords. For each service that you use, you should use a own user credential password combination. That's because if a hacker can compromise one of your credentials, he will then not be able to use these credentials to access your other services. For an example, if you have a Steam account, and the hacker will get your credentials, he or she can then probably use these credentials to access your mailbox. And in your mailbox, you may have sensitive information like access codes to other systems and so on and so on. And the hacker gets really easy access to most of your services. If you use multiple passwords, you don't have this problem to begin with because it's really difficult to manage that many passwords. In my case, it's over 100 and you probably cannot keep them all in your mind all the time. You can use a password manager. A password manager is a tool which has a database which is really strongly encrypted and you access this database by using one really, really secure password you know in your mind and in this database there are all those different credentials for your different services. For my personal use, I can recommend using KeePass, which is an open source software. It's really convenient, it's fast and it's absolutely free and you can even access the source code if you like. That concludes our lesson for today. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. If you don't want to miss the next episode, please make sure to subscribe and ring the bell. If you like this video, please click the like button. If you are interested in a specific other topic or if you have questions to this episode, please leave a comment below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Stay tuned, see you next time.